Public affairs programming on WQPT is brought to you by The Singh Group at Merrill Lynch. Serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years. Finally, an agreement on education spending in Illinois and revving up some very small motors that go pretty fast in the streets of the cities. It's been two of the most painful years in Illinois school history. As lawmakers in Springfield argued over the future of education in the state, school districts worried about the present right now. With funds running out and reserve funding already being tapped, some districts were actually looking to borrow money just to keep the doors open. Lawmakers passed a state budget in July, but it called for education reforms before schools could get their money. Well, this week, those state lawmakers patted themselves on the back for bipartisanship, freeing up the money and creating what some say is real education reform. That may be true, but it was supposed to be done half a year ago. Joining us are two superintendents who have had to plan for a new school year with very different and very uncertain funding. Uh, Dr. Mike Oberhaus is the head of the Rock Island Milan School District. Dr. Jay Morrow with United Township. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us. It has been, uh, I'm telling you something you already know, an incredible three months at least. Uh, Dr. Oberhaus, what, what has it been? Because you're trying to plan for a school year and the state has everything bottled up. Uh, it, it's been a difficult start financially to the year. Uh, a lot of uncertainty, stress and anxiety. Uh, we were starting to plan the what ifs. We don't have state funding. How do we keep going? How much borrowing will we be able to do? At what cost? Um, so it's a relief that yeah, we can quit those plans now and start working on what our true purpose is and that's educating our kids. Well, Dr. Morrow, I mean, people were thinking, hey, we may have to close school by Halloween. I mean, was that a real possibility or was that just kind of a, oh, this will all get settled? I think it depended on your location within the state and their financial situation of each individual district, but it certainly was a concern for many districts that may have uh, neared their borrowing capacity or just didn't have the reserves to make it through an entire year. Well, and let's be honest, when you're talking about not having the reserves, there had been talk that some of the lawmakers, uh, Republicans in the Assembly and in the Senate, thought the school districts had too much reserves and they didn't mind the fact that you started draining that. Yeah, and that was certainly going out there as a, as a possibility and the districts such as uh, many of the districts around here that do have some reserves were, were prepared to use them. That's what they're, the reserves are there for in a situation such as this. So now looking back, I mean, was this all worth it as far as the school district is concerned because there is some reform measures involved in this uh, legislation? I think the true measure of that will be in two to three years after really? everything shakes out, after the funding formula is in place for a couple of years and all the kinks are, are worked out because uh, on the surface this year, uh, appears okay, but after the new formula, there's always going to be tweaks to it. There's mm -hmm. always going to be some interpretations, and what those numbers are in year two, three, and five are going to be the true measure to see if this truly brought reform. Well, and Dr. Oberhaus, as you know, I mean, there's school districts all throughout the state of Illinois that have different requirements, different needs, different ability to, to uh, fund their uh, student education. So it, it's hard for the state to kind of come up with a blanket idea that works well for each district. Correct, and that's the beauty of this new formula. Mm -hmm. It is really based on 27 different variables of what it takes to have an adequate education. Uh, and, and it accounts for kids rather than ability to pay. And once they create that, then they look at the ability to pay both locally and from a state perspective to fund. Um, they also know that uh, Illinois has the greatest disparity between the districts that spend the most and the districts that spend the less, the least. And <clears throat> through the new formula, those that spend the least will get the most new money coming out of the gates. So the funding will help bring those at the bottom up at a much more rapid pace than the old formula while not harming the people at the top. So we think it's a real win long term as long as they don't make a lot of changes to what they just passed. Which they could do at any time, I Correct. take it. Um, was it a hard fought victory, at least for school superintendents? I mean, you wanted money, per, well, I, I shouldn't say that. You wanted your money right away. Did you want your money more than your reforms? I think it was a blend. We wanted the money, but the education funding system in Illinois was the worst in the country. And so it needed to be uh, evolved into something that would make sense and be adequate for all students, no matter what the zip code uh, in Illinois. And I think you'll see that disparity uh, shrink over time as a result of that. Um, but yeah, we desperately needed the money. 
in order to keep going. In our district, 42% of our monies come from the state of Illinois. So it's a pretty big dent in our budget when it, if we didn't have that funding source. And for UT, it's a significant amount as well. Absolutely, about 30% of our funds. And the concern with it is you know, if they didn't fund it this year and we would have to live on our reserves for the year, what's going to happen the following year? The catch up, if you will, because once those, re re those reserves are depleted, they're, they're gone, you'll never see them again, and it'll take years to build up, as they have been. So that was a major concern. Is it also still a concern? Because, I mean, some districts have depleted their reserve, taken a big chunk out of them. And as you said, it, it is a rainy day fund, and in Illinois there seems to be a lot of rain. Absolutely, it's been raining now for at least six or seven years the state aid has been prorated since I believe 2009 2010 and so districts haven't been receiving the state allotment the normal state allotment since since that time and so it's been really a struggle and really at least speaking for most of the Quad City Illinois Quad City area schools that we've cut to the bone for the most part and it's going to take a few years to dig back out and get our programs where they need to be. Well, Dr. Oberhaus, I wanted to talk about that. Let's talk specifically about Rock Island Milan. I mean, you've had to make cuts over a period of a number of years. Okay. Some of the worst, uh, some of the biggest cuts uh, being most recent. What does this funding now mean? Are there some programs that could come back? Are there some <coughs> teaching positions that might be able to be reestablished? Um, in the long term, yes. In the short term, uh, so for example, we believe we're going to generate about $2 million more in state money this coming year. And that's a real positive, and we're really grateful for that. But a week and a half ago, the Department of Revenue shared with us that uh, through some miscalculations, we're going to see $1.2 million less in corporate personal property replacement taxes. Um, so you're, what you're saying is you're seeing an $800,000 gain? Correct, correct, um, from where we thought we were going to be. But over time, as I said, uh, we're a Tier 1 district, and so we'll start to see more of that. If new monies go into the formula, we'll see a greater percentage of those funds flow to us as compared to what it had been historically. Uh, so long term, I think we will be a benefactor of the new formula. And UT, I'd assume, as yeah, well? Absolutely. We would uh, receive about $1.1 million additional. We had about a $500,000 $500, hit on the replacement tax that Dr. Oberhaus was talking about. Uh, so that looks like a net of $600,000, but there's other factors at play, such as uh, we still have money back, back owed to us last year from uh, uh, from what are called categorical grants. And if those aren't paid by December 31st, that money might be gone. For us, that's about $300,000. And there's such a backlog of bills still to be paid by the comptroller, we don't know if that money's there or not, even with the income tax increase that went in July 1st. So um, we're cautiously optimistic that <laughs> this will uh, this will have a positive impact on us this year, but it, I think, as I said earlier, the true in, impact is going to be two or three, four years down the line. Yeah, cautiously optimistic, that's a phrase we've heard a lot of, yes. but hopefully we're cautiously yep. optimistic this time it's true, Correct. Right? That's correct. I know you guys uh, uh, talk to <coughs> each of your superintendent friends all throughout, and I, and, and I know that one of the greatest disparities, as a matter of fact, in America, uh, with a district that's not doing as well or doesn't have the same resources with a district that is doing very well is actually Geneseo and then Carbon Cliff Barstow being two very opposites with Geneseo doing very well. What will this bill be able to do for uh, a, a parity to make somewhat, because right. they're never going to be absolutely equal districts, but what do you see that the state has done that is going to make it at least more fair? So what they've done is with the lowest uh, tiered of lowest funded schools, they're in what's called tier one, and any new dollars into the education formula, 40% of those automatically get f f funneled in first into uh, the tier one schools, and then tier one and tier two schools are then added together, and they get 50% of that new funding. So 90% going to tier one and tier two. Tier three are the school districts that are over adequacy already. They get 9% and those in tier four, which are way over adequacy already, would only get 1%. The funding from a prior distributed in a more equitable manner to everybody in the state. So this will help to bring that, the lowest spending districts up at a much more rapid level as compared to the top, mm -hmm. um, as compared to the prior formula. So it's really a positive long term to really lower or to narrow that disparity in funding gap. It just seems to be a no-brainer to have created this system and to kind of correct the uh, inequities here. What, what took so long? Well, I think there's a variety of, of factors. Certainly, uh, the power base, uh, the political power base in Illinois is uh, very diverse, if you will. And 
uh, this new funding formula in the long run may have a negative impact on state funds towards the wealthier communities. Mm -hmm. Certainly, uh, if you live in uh, one of those, if you're fortunate to live in one of those communities, you don't want any additional resources taken away from you. So I think that was a big part of it. Well, let's talk about one of the things that uh, the Democrats were really upset about, and that is, uh, I guess you could say, added funding. I know it's through a scholarship program and, and a diversion of money, so to speak, that could go for uh, private schools. A lot of people were upset about that. I know uh, a Chicago Teachers Union was upset about that. Does that have a major impact as far as Quad City schools are concerned? Uh, it, we're yet to know the mm -hmm. details of what that is and how it's going to work. Uh, so we can't predict with that right now. Um, obviously, we tend not to want to have dollars diverted into other districts, but uh, the time will tell how that will unfold as the details come out as to how that program will actually be implemented. Well, and the real question is, does it set a precedent that, that worries school superintendents of public schools? Yeah, I think the biggest concern is the precedent that it, this may, may set. And it, does it open the door for vouchers? And if, if it does indeed, wherever that voucher goes, if it goes to a private school, will the private schools be held accountable in a similar fashion that public schools are? Um, and that's the biggest concern as far as equity uh, from my perspective mm -hmm. is uh, will they um, open their doors to all of our students just as we open our doors to all of their students or will they be a little more selective? Will it be cherry picking of the very best or, or the very best, most athletic or talented uh, as far as music is concerned? And let's talk about the mandates too because that's another major factor of this bill. Does this mean that uh, unfunded mandates like physical education classes and driver's ed uh, can be easily scuttled in district after district? Well, I don't know if they can be scuttled. I think it gives us the opportunity to look at alternative ways to do uh, those programs. I think the districts will have to look in individually into their own uh, local environment and determine what's the best interest for their students and their community uh, in, in doing that. Uh, so time will tell. We need to mm -hmm. investigate and look at and, and is there a capacity to even do some of those things in the local marketplace uh, moving forward. So are there dr private driving companies that can handle the capacity if the local school districts all said we want to third party that out and not do that anymore. So well, those are things we'll consider. And as you said, you can adapt it district to district, and sometimes the, the superintendents and the school boards are some, somewhat creative when it comes to getting the education mm -hmm. across at the least amount of money. Right. I think it really depends, like Dr. Oberhaus said, on the situations. Right now, I don't see the Illinois Quad City area being equipped to handle the uh, hundreds of sophomores or freshmen uh, students that are at the 15-year-old age group uh, to handle the behind the wheel right. uh, training. I just don't see that. Over time that may happen and give options to school districts to save some money. I don't see it being a huge impact in the immediate future. Dr. Oberhaus, you get the last word. You want every kid, school age kid, to go to school at every least day. about one day in particular coming up. Uh, today actually Is that was all right? our challenge five day. Uh, through the United Way and our Conic Foundation, we are pushing really hard throughout the bi-state community. Uh, to make sure kids come to school every day. We know that those that tend not to come uh, more than nine days have a, a much higher probability of not being successful in attaining their high school diploma and dropping out. And we as a community want every child to be successful and you have to come to school to do that. So we really are pushing uh, to make sure kids are aware and families are aware and give some hip tips as to how to make sure your kids can come to school every day. Dr. Oberhaus, Dr. Morrill, thank you so, so much for joining us. We're thank happy you. that you're probably sleeping you. better these nights uh, now that this is all settled. We are also heading into September and our leisure time plans are changing, but there's still plenty of things to do in the cities as summer comes to an end. Here's Laura Adams with some ideas that you should consider if you go out and about. This is Out and About for August 28th through September 3rd. Hi, I'm Laura Adams. Enjoy a Fall Harvest Festival at the Walnut Grove Pioneer Village in Long Grove on September 3rd and 4th, or take in the Old Threshers Reunion at the Mount Pleasant Fairgrounds featuring country music August 31st through September 4th. Visit Mercado on 5th, the outdoor night market in Moline. Enjoy a bite to eat, live music and shopping every Friday starting at 5. And the Viva Quad Cities Fiesta celebrating over 20 years of Latino culture takes place September 2nd, just west of the iWireless Center. Check out the Chief Blackhawk Antique Motorcycle Swap Meet at the Mississippi Valley Fairgrounds through September 2nd, and the Rock Island Grand Prix comes back to downtown Rock Island September 2nd and 3rd. The Rally for a Welcoming Quad Cities takes place at Schwebert Riverfront Park August 27th at 4, or join the QC Festival of Praise, a night to honor our heroes in LeClaire Park September 3rd. 
Frenzy Players is holding auditions for their upcoming production of Shakespeare's All's Well That Ends Well at the Dear Wyman House August 24th and 26th. QC Theatre Workshop opens their season August 25th with a new play by Aaron Randolph III called Broken, an unflinching yet hopeful look at human trafficking. And there's one more chance to see No Business Like Show Business featuring the Circa 21 bootleggers at the Downtown Theatre on the 31st. For more information, visit wqpt.org. Thank you, Laura. The littlest racers with the biggest reputation. Go-karts get ready to take over the streets of the cities. That's still to come. But first, we head to the community stage at the River Music Experience. Local musician David G. Smith co-wrote this song about a scoutmaster who died from Parkinson's disease. It's called Doesn't Take Much Light. Called my old scout master, Ernest Che, out of the blue. His wife said he's having a bad day. He'd be glad to hear from you. Ernest Che came on the line, and I talked about me growing up poor and not having my dad around. I figured out where the money came from for summer camp. Of you. Those are some of the best days I ever had I haven't forgotten and I wanted to tell you that It's why I call The smallest gesture can spark a life Kindle the courage to fight the good fight To get the picture Look up at any star It doesn't take much light To shine in the dark Ernest J, your wife tells me You're not feeling well because You've got something doctors think is Parkinson's yeah, he said, I've had it now For a few years it's been rough But like they say, some days you're the windshield And some days you're the bug Sometimes I tell myself I'm gonna win And sometimes I just wanna toss the towel in On days like today, it's good to get help too Remind me who I am And that the smallest gesture Can spark a life Kindle the courage To fight the good fight To get the picture To look up at any star It doesn't take much light to shine in the dark Hey Ernest J I'm meeting with my scouts tonight Gonna set up a telescope and point it at the sky Put it into focus I'm gonna tell them what you always told us That the small this gesture can spark a life, kindle the courage to fight the good fight, to get the picture, look up at any star. It doesn't take much light to shine in the dark. It doesn't take much light. That's David G. Smith at the RME's community stage. Liberty Day weekend is a time to break the speed limit in parts of the Rock Island District. For the 23rd year, go-karts are racing through the streets for the annual Rock Island Grand Prix. It's become a premier event that has actually put the cities on the map. 
And joining us is Grand Prix organizer, the president of the organization, Roger Ruthard. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. 23 years. When did we get old? Yeah, really. <laughs> haven't we done this before? Yeah, haven't we done this before? <coughs> and, and, and I think it's really something that people may not understand is that they go to see the races. It's cool. It's, it's, it's neat. But they don't understand the significance it is in, in the karting world that what Rock Island is. Yeah, I think there, there's a number of different factors that come together, but um, karting is a sport is a sport into itself where people just go you know race against each other every weekend. We have several tracks around here where that happens, but it's also um, sort of the entry level into larger motorsports. It's, it's where you know when you're young as a kid, you can learn the basics of racing. And then when you're old enough to get in a car or open wheel or sports car or whatever it is you're going to race, you have that basic knowledge. Mm -hmm. So there are people in the sport who are using it as a stepping stone to, to get, you know, to greater things. And we've had people that have gone through here and, you know, have raced at Rock Island and then raced at the top levels of motorsports. And so when you talk to people about, you know, at NASCAR or IndyCar or whatever, they understand what Rock Island is. They know about the Rock Island Grand Prix and how long it's been going on and, um, and just the notoriety and, and professionalism that we have here. Is it unusual for these races to be a Grand Prix rather than being, let's say, on a closed track or even just an oval? Yeah, mo most cart, cart tracks are small tracks in the middle of a cornfield somewhere yeah, right. or I mean, out in the country. Um, so they're not used to racing in front of people. Or, you know, it, it's mom and dad and... And sister, racing maybe. with people that are just on the other side of chicken wire in many cases. Well, yeah, but here it's here it's whole, it's totally different because of everything else that the district and the Quad Cities as a whole have to offer. This is oftentimes the race that everybody brings their family, mm -hmm. they bring their sponsors, they bring you know their you know their friends and and take them to, to say, oh, this is this is how I race go karts when it's really a little bit different from what they do yeah. every day. And you've really marketed it as well as saying, hey, look, there's a lot to offer in downtown Rock Island. I mean, we've got theaters, we've got comedy, we've got hotels oh, and restaurants. Absolutely, and there's no place else that has that. You know, well, it's, it's just even the, some of the other smaller street races are in small towns that, mm -hmm. that don't have nearly the amenities that the Quad Cities has. And I mean, even just the idea of having an airport where people can you know, send their equipment across country by truck and then fly into race. I mean, we have a number of people that do that. So it, it's there's a lot of thing, a lot of things that come together and uh, make this sort of a once in in the world event. Well, and you kind of think that the uh, Rock Island Grand Prix would be kind of a local event and then maybe more a regional event, but no, it's really gotten to become nationally known and you actually have some people from other countries that are here. Oh yeah, we every year we have racers from coast to coast and uh, over the years we've been doing it I think we've had people from eight or ten foreign countries. Uh, we, I'm not sure exactly what we have this year. I know we have at least one Canadian team and one from Bermuda um, and there may be some others but um, it, it's, it has that you know that worldly buzz that, mm -hmm. that n nobody else has. And part of that is just the fact that we've been doing it for so long and so well. Time trials are basically Saturday and then the um, money races, I would say, are on Sunday? Right. Um, Saturday morning is practice. Uh, Saturday afternoon is, is heat races. And uh, we have kind of unique format for our heat races in that um, normally, I mean, the race normally determines the starting order for the finals. Mm -hmm. But the way we do it, we also give points for how many car carts a driver will pass during the heat race. Oh, okay. So there's actually, I mean, there's, there's a little incentive nail there. to nail racing from the front yeah. of the back to the back, front of the grid to the back, which makes, the, and there's, there's short races, but it makes it for really exciting racing on, on Saturday. It's definitely a different feel than on Sunday. And then Sunday, it's a round of practice in the morning, opening ceremonies about 10.30, 10.45. Um, we have an a autograph session where kids can come out and get autographs and then we go racing and it's, uh, it's definitely a, d a different feel. I mean, there's a lot of different types of carts and, and uh, they're all on display, you know, in these various races, but each, each different type has its own sort of um, feel for how it, how it races. You know, the, the carts that have, you know, the five-speed gearbox, they're, go they're the fastest and they're going, 80, 90 miles an hour, mm -hmm. and 
The ones that are a little slower, you'll see a lot more drafting and, and strategy involved between different drivers. So um, every, every race is a little bit different. You also have a memorial race, uh, which was really important for one of the people that's been so instrumental uh, for karting in the Quad Cities. Well, yeah, um, I mean, I think everybody these days almost, it seems, knows somebody who's uh, been a victim of suicide or extended you know, friends and family, and certainly that's the case in the local karting community. And, Several years ago, we lost uh, one of our racers, Travis DeVrint, who was, uh, actually had won here. Um, and uh, it was re really sad. Nobody really saw it coming, at, you know. And we just thought it was important, along with his family, to take the opportunity every year to raise awareness for that and to get people to talk about it more and not leave it in the shadows. It's something that, um, you know, hopefully other families can not have to go through the, mm -hmm. what the carding community here has had to go through by just, you know, looking for things and talking about it and being aware. Well, the other thing that you, you really point out about the Grand Prix is that it really is a family event. And, oh, and it fits into your budget, too. Yeah, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a family event, both in terms of many of the race teams, but also it's, um, you know, it's free family entertainment. You come down there and uh, bring a lawn chair or just walk around. There's people that you know bring pop-up tents and groups that have been, <coughs> excuse me, that have been tailgating in the same spot right. for years, you know, and all of that is happening. It's just, and then of course there's other things. There's a there's a car show on Sunday. There's nightly outdoor concerts. There's it's just a huge event. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a huge weekend. A lot of things going on, and um, it's just really you know something that sort of puts our community on the map is there a favorite or is there like a villain that we should be rooting against i mean what should we look for no there's no fa no favorites <laughs> and no villains but you know every year there's surprises and so um like last year we had a, a racer uh from illinois who won five races and the year before uh, we had a local racer uh tony nielsen from delmar who won four yeah some um, can dominate yeah, so, you know, the stars can align and, yeah. and who knows what happens. Last year we had almost every uh, lap record for every race broken. We had had a uh, record for the, um, the fastest lap ever run on the track that it was 10 years old and it was broken three times in one race last year. Wow. And the guy didn't even win who he turned in the <laughs> fastest lap. So there's, there's always excitement, yeah. there's always fun, there's, you know, occasionally a crash here and there. And, but it's just fun to be able to walk around and watch the racing from different perspectives, take a break and visit some of the downtown businesses or you know, have lunch or a drink or something and go back out and uh, watch some more. Great weather too. Yeah, it'll be beautiful. Roger Ruthard with the uh, Rock Island Grand Prix. Thanks so much for joining us, we appreciate it. Thank you. Rev those engines. See you right? this weekend. WQPT is doing its part to support the military men and women in the cities who are serving our nation. We call it embracing the military. And newcomers to the Rock Island Arsenal are invited to another of the monthly welcoming tours. This one of the RIA factory. The tour held Thursday, September 7th, starting at 10 in the morning. And this month's first Friday event is a bags tournament at the Rock Island Clubhouse. Winning teams of two will get Visa gift cards and other prizes. You can sign up at the Fitness Center and get ready to play next Friday starting at 5. On the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device. Thanks for taking some time to join us we talk about the issues on the cities. Public Affairs Programming on WQPT is brought to you by The Singh Group at Merrill Lynch. Serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years.